A psychic who visited this haunted house painted a picture of the ghost, and it's pretty spooky. She fell down the stairs, and she swears she got pushed. That was a rest home for the ladies of the Order of the Eastern Star. A walker. Oh, sh. Holy. We're at a real life haunted mansion in Massachusetts. That's the fucking noise we were hearing. Yeah, it's going crazy. Are you the woman who died right there in that chair? Can you ring that bell? This honestly could take the cake for some of the most intelligent paranormal activity we've ever caught on camera. And it's only been 30 minutes. Whatever you do, never say this poem out loud because if you do, you might die. There is a cursed Japanese poem called Tomino's Hell and many people believe that if you read it out loud, you will die or be cursed for the rest of your life. One of these deaths was Shuji Teriyama, who made a movie after this poem and exactly one week after the movie was released, he suddenly just dropped dead to everybody's surprise. Another time, this college girl was dared by her friends to say the poem out loud. And she did, and exactly one week later, she suddenly just died. The poem is right here, and for it to even work, you have to read it in Japanese. So all of us English speakers are on the safe side. Or so I think, but I'm not reading this out loud in English either. Now you can read it in your head and nothing will happen to you, but you literally cannot read it out loud. This is a very cursed poem in Japan and many people believe it to be 100% real. So I don't know about you, but I'm not reading Tamino's Hell at all because I'm not risking anything. What would you do if you found out your sweet little neighbor was actually a serial killer? Dorothea Puente opened up a boarding house in California in the 70s. This catered mostly to clients who were struggling with addiction and mental illness. However, things would only get worse for these residents. One by one, they started passing away and people started asking questions about what was going on behind the scenes. In the fascinating podcast, Killer Psyche, retired FBI agent Candice DeLong explores Dorothea's case and the hidden desires and motives of more cold-blooded killers. It would take years for the gruesome truth to be uncovered about the killer landlady when officers eventually dug up her garden. It was discovered there was at least seven bodies buried on her land. Everyone was wondering what on earth caused this sweet old lady to start murdering her tenants one by one. Tune in to Killer Psyche to find out. Check out Wondery's Exhibit C library for your true crime fix. From shocking scams to crazy cults to cold case murders, Exhibit C literally has the most nail-biting crime stories documented in such thorough research ways. This has always been one of the strangest missing person cases, and there are finally some updates. This is Carly Gousset. She went missing on October 13th, 2018 from her family's home in Chalfont, California. She was officially last seen alongside US Highway 6 in Eastern California. Five years later, police are now looking for evidence and clues in the town of Tonopah, Nevada. According to an investigator with the Sheriff's Office in Mono County, California, in March of 2021, his office received a phone call from a recovering drug user who reportedly saw Carly at a party in Tonopah. Tonopah is a historic mining town about 100 miles away from where Carly disappeared. Investigators have not yet released the witness's name or when he reportedly saw Carly, but they have seized a vehicle that they say may have picked Carly up alongside Highway 6 and taken her to Tonopah. This is a major breakthrough as not a single trace of Carly has been found since she went missing. It's like she vanished into thin air. To kind of recap her case, the night before she disappeared, Carly, who was 16 years old at the time, told her family that she was going to a football game at her high school in Bishop, California. But instead, she secretly went to a house party with her then boyfriend and another friend. At the house party, Carly smoked weed, and not long after, she became frantic and paranoid. According to her boyfriend, she became erratic and was scared of the music and him. Carly then called her stepmom, Melissa, to come and pick her up in Highland Park, which isn't far from the family home. But by the time Melissa got there, Carly was nowhere to be found. She eventually found Carly walking down a dark road looking pale as a ghost about a mile away. And when she got in the car, she was still acting super paranoid and not really making sense. When they got home, Melissa and Carly's dad, Zachary, tried to calm her down. They believed that whatever she smoked that night was possibly laced with another drug. Melissa spent the rest of the night with Carly trying to comfort her, and she even recorded an eight minute long conversation she had with Carly in hopes to show her why she should never do drugs again. 
During that recorded conversation, Carly was sobbing and said to Melissa, quote, you're going to kill me. In which Melissa replied, quote, why would I do such a thing? Carly can be heard asking to be taken to the hospital, but sadly, that never happened. Melissa eventually went to sleep, and the last time she saw Carly, she was in her bed, and it was around 5.45 that morning. When Melissa woke up for the day, Carly's cell phone was on the counter, the front door was slightly ajar, and Carly was missing. Melissa and Zachary searched the neighborhood, but when they couldn't find her, they called 911. A massive search was launched, involving hundreds of volunteers and multiple different agencies, but no trace of Carly was ever found. There were, however, three eyewitnesses who claimed to have seen Carly the morning she disappeared. Two witnesses were neighbors who lived only a few doors down from the Gousset family who claimed to have seen Carly walking down White Mountain Estates Road holding a piece of paper and looking up at the sky. She was reportedly heading in the direction of Highway 6. A third eyewitness saw someone fitting Carly's description standing in the sagebrush on the side of that same highway, Highway 6. This is the exact same spot where tracking dogs lost Carly's scent. After Carly went missing, her stepmom Melissa started going live on Facebook trying to urge people to help in the search, and a lot of people watching kind of deemed her behavior as suspicious. But again, no one knows how they would truly act when something this horrible happens. Then in 2019, the case was featured on Dr. Phil, where Carly's mom Lindsay said that she suspects that Carly died from a drug overdose, and she questioned whether or not she ever made it out of that house alive. But to this day, police have found no incriminating evidence against Melissa or Zachary. Along with that, they have since both taken a polygraph and they both passed. There's been a lot that has happened since Carly disappeared, such as her dad Zachary being arrested on charges unrelated to her disappearance. In 2021, he was reportedly charged with a felony count of corporal injury to a spouse, but the arrest record has since been removed from the Mono County Sheriff's Office website. Again, this seems to be a domestic violence related incident and not connected to Carly's disappearance. There was also a video on YouTube that went viral from someone dirt biking who claimed to have found Carly or thought they found Carly while in the mountains. They used her picture in the thumbnail and used her story as clickbait. This was confirmed to not be her, but unfortunately, this misinformation spread like wildfire. As of today, five years later, Carly is still missing. Anyone with information is urged to contact the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. There's a lot of shit on P. Diddy being connected to a lot of people's deaths. So recently, there's been an investigation going on and the theories that P. Diddy has connections to Michael Jackson's death. No way. And it's known that he hates the industry. There was a video of him at an award ceremony. They try to fuck up his career because Michael Jackson basically owned over 50% of Sony Records. These guys work really hard at their craft. The companies take advantage of them. They never thought that this performer myself would outthink them. I own half of Sony's publishing and I'm leaving them. They're very angry at me because of it, but how is this connected to P. Diddy, right? P. Diddy, he had a head of security, was a guy that any employees that P. Diddy has, if you ever get pulled over in California or in Miami, to call this guy, Fahim, and he'll take care of it. He'll make any problem, any police trouble disappear. So he has power in the and the police. Michael Jackson died in 2009. That guy, Fahim, in 2008, he graduated from college. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in real estate and business and had no experience in security or anything like that. So how is a guy who just graduated college the head of security already for Michael Jackson, the biggest music artist of all time? Because he was there at Michael Jackson's testimony and he was the second person on the scene whenever Michael Jackson died because first it was obviously the doctor who was trying to Son vanished and was found dead six years later. In a disturbing twist, police now believe she has been murdered. Lola Karabiva is a 61-year-old woman described by loved ones as beautiful, kind, an amazing woman and a true friend. She was originally from Uzbekistan and didn't actually have any other relatives in the US apart from her husband, 65-year-old Vladimir. She was last seen alive on October the 12th at her house in Philadelphia. She'd just come back from a trip to Europe, which she had been really looking forward to, and neighbours believe she'd been away for roughly two or three weeks. She was reported missing and police immediately started looking into where the woman may be. The first port of call was her home, and after two unsuccessful searches, they finally had a breakthrough on the third search. They made a horrifying discovery on the 16th of October. Her lifeless body was found wrapped in plastic and taped up in a wardrobe in her home. Police also discovered a dark stain on the floor, which they believe may have been blood. So what could the motive be for this horrific murder and who could have committed it? 
Interestingly, police are looking into the possibility that an argument could have started between Vladimir and his wife. It's thought that this may have been around her late son. Now, the son disappeared back in 2004 and was then found dead six years later. He'd actually been out hiking and was tragically just 19 years old when he vanished. It's reported that the 12th of October would have been his birthday. Vladimir has been arrested and charged with abuse of a corpse. And although there's obviously suspicion surrounding him, he's not actually been charged with her murder as yet. Lola's cause of death is yet to be determined. The incident with Rey Mysterio and El Perro Aguayo Jr. This was a wrestling match, a tag team match, uh -huh. where it was going to be one of the biggest wrestlers here in the United States being Rey Mysterio, one of the biggest wrestlers in Mexico being El Perro Aguayo Jr. Everybody's obviously excited to see this wrestling match, and it's going normal, it's going fine, they're going at it with each other and stuff, but the one specific part of the wrestling match, which is about to be the end, basically, you see Rey Mysterio want to set up like his signature move, and it goes off script, because you know how wrestling is scripted, mm -hmm. so it goes off off script and El Perro Aguayo Jr. he like falls out of the ring but he falls awkwardly he basically like hit the edge of the, the arena with his back <laughs> oh my yeah. god so it was, he goes back on the arena because he knows that it was like not part of the script and then that's when he gets drop kicked and when he gets drop kicked he goes against the ropes like he was supposed to but he just kind of falls unconscious everybody's still like cheering, cheering and shit you know he's just knocked out Rey Mysterio does a signature move it just kind of goes over El Perro Aguayo Jr. just head because he's still like just laying there even somebody comes over and start shaking him and like saying yo bro wake up wake up wake up the wrestling match finishes and Rey Mysterio's team wins instead of cheering everybody's still concerned because he has now moved from that same position at this point everybody goes over to him and realize that he's not conscious right and he died uh, live on TV did Rey Mysterio get backlash after this yeah so after that whole incident happened because it was an accident at the yeah end yeah day, yeah a lot of people were sending Rey Mysterio death threats he was even thinking about quitting wrestling completely because this man was caught on camera murdering his wife and he only got 10 years in prison. Carrie Birmingham, who was 60 years old, shot his wife Patricia Birmingham, who was 48 years old. He shot her three times outside their home in Spring, Texas, and the couple had been arguing for about 30 minutes after Carrie allegedly discovered the affair his wife was having. This incident was captured on video by his wife Patricia, and in the disturbing video, Carrie can be seen walking in the driveway with a bathrobe on and a shotgun in his hand. Carrie can also be heard telling his wife, quote, okay, bye, you're going to meet Jesus. I hope it was worth it, end quote, before shooting her three times and killing her. Whatever you do, don't look up the video. It honestly is pretty disturbing and I wouldn't recommend watching it. After doing this, Carrie was arrested and charged with murder being held on a $200,000 bond, and recently in 2024, Carrie Birmingham pleaded guilty to the murder, but claimed he shot his wife in the heat of the moment. And despite the jury being all females, the woman sentenced Carrie to 10 years in prison with parole eligibility in five years. Now I'm going to play a short clip from the video showing Carrie talking to Patricia before he shot her dead. The video? A bullet. A man that can bullet. This horrifying video depicts the death of a skydiver. In the video, Ivan Lester McGuire, the man holding the camera, jumps out of the airplane. But suddenly, when the parachutes are deployed, Ivan discovers he didn't wear a parachute. So unfortunately, I couldn't find any photos of Ivan McGuire, the man who jumped from the plane. But this incident occurred in 1988 in California. On that day, Ivan was tasked with videotaping a skydiving instructor and a student while they embarked on a routine jump. Now, at the time, the plane was 10,500 feet above the surface of Earth. And the theory goes that Ivan thought he was wearing a parachute, maybe because he was tired, because he thought he already had it on. Ivan already had a recorded 800 jumps, so people knew he wouldn't just make a mistake like this. But either way, Ivan ended up jumping out of the plane and only realized mid-jump that he didn't have a parachute on. Obviously, he passed away once his body hit the ground. An investigation was opened up into the pilot of the plane because apparently pilots are always supposed to check on their passengers to make sure they have their parachutes on before they jump. But it was just a few tragic errors and miscalculations that day that led to this death. I'm going to show you the last moments of this footage right now. It's just absolutely disturbing and frightening to try to put yourself in his shoes and get into his mind, realizing that you're staring at the ground rapidly approaching you without a parachute. 
I just can't even begin to comprehend the terror he must have felt searching his back and staring down at the ground as it rapidly approached him. It's just so eerie. There should be no law against killing people. I know it's a wrong thing, but hell, 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 you restrict somebody from it, they're going to want it more. We found our victim, and sad as it may be, she's our... The two teenage boys who filmed that video, Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik, then went on after recording that to murder their classmate. Their classmate's name was Cassie Jo Stoddard, and this is an infamous case from Idaho. So Brian and Tori were obsessed with horror movies. They specifically loved the movie Scream. And in home recordings that the two actually made before the murder, they talked about how they wanted to create a real-life horror movie. Well, on September 22, 2006, these two decided that their first victim would be their 16-year-old classmate, Cassie Jo. And on that day, they created a death list of other people they wanted to murder as well. That night, Cassie Jo was house-sitting for her aunt and uncle at this property shown above. It's rural, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, and it was the perfect place for a crime. So on that evening, Cassie actually had her boyfriend Matt over. And at some point during the night, Brian and Tori, the killers, who were actually friends of the couple, came over for a tour of the house. Cassie had no idea that while those two teenagers were in her home, one of them had gone downstairs and unlocked the basement door so that they could come back later. At some point later on in the night, Brian and Tori returned to the house wearing creepy masks. They then proceeded from the basement to turn off the power in the home, shutting off all of the lights. The two were hoping that Cassie and her boyfriend would come down to check on this, but neither of them did, so they turned the lights back on. At one point, Cassie's boyfriend even noticed that the dog was staring down in the basement, and he thought this was suspicious. And that evening, Matt, Cassie's boyfriend, called his mother to see if he could spend the night with Cassie because she felt so scared. Matt's mom said that Cassie could come over to their house with him, but he couldn't spend the night. But Cassie assured Matt that she would be fine, so she sent him on his way, and she was alone in the home. When Matt's mother came to pick him up from Cassie's house, he actually called one of the killers. And when Tori picked up the phone, he was whispering. Now, Matt assumed that's because these two were in a movie theater, but they were actually in Cassie's basement. At this point, their plan was a go. The two started coming up from the basement. They slammed the door to the basement to scare Cassie, and then they attacked her, stabbing her 30 times. It was said by the person who discovered Cassie's body that this was an extremely gruesome, graphic, and horrific scene. After the murder, these two sped off in their vehicle, recorded all of this, and then disposed of all of their clothing, the weapon, the masks, at a nearby nature area called Black Rock Canyon. Eventually, they led investigators back to dig up what they had buried, and what they found was disturbing. This is the murder weapon, and this is an example of one of the masks that these two were wearing when they murdered Cassie. Now, thankfully, both of these two got life in prison without the possibility of parole. But to end this TikTok, I'm going to show you the rest of that video they recorded after they murdered Cassie. Let me warn you again, this is really disturbing stuff. Our first victim is going to be Cassie daughter. She's going to be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? I, I mean, like, holy shit, dude. I'm horny just thinking about it. Hell yeah. I was nine... 50, September 22nd, 2006. We know there's lots of doors. There, there's lots of places to hide. I locked the back doors. That's all locked. Now we just gotta wait. I just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I'm I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, oh I just killed God. Cassie. The Perea diving incident, the most horrifying diving incidents in history. I can't hit the ocean, bro. In Trinidad and Tobago, this company, Perea, has an oil line, right? And they had sent these professional divers to basically go and do like a maintenance check, which consisted of five guys. They've done those jobs like a million times. Because you were trained for this type of like job. This right here. Birth six. Okay. Which basically is the entrance of the pipe. And in total, it was 1,200 feet. God damn. They got there. They set up a habitat on top of the pipeline. It's like a metal bucket that goes on top of the pipeline. Since it's high pressure, it pushes the water out. So it becomes like an air pocket in there. So they could take off their scuba dive gear and then they could get to work. And this is all on GoPro footage. I'm going to show you the GoPro. What? Okay. He goes back. And the reason why he's getting the wrench is because they got to loosen the plug. And it's like air sealed. And out of nowhere, the screen goes black. Then he passed his boy his wrench already. Okay. 
I'm just waiting for the fucking. I spoke too soon. So basically what happened was is that the water rushed into the habitat and it created like a vortex and it rushed into the pipe. So it sucked all five of them down. They don't know if they got sucked in feet first or head first. That's how fast it was. The five of them end up in the same spot. And they're just calling out for each other and they're like, we got to get out of here. But we got to decide what way to go. So they decided we all got sucked in feet first. Let's just go that way. And eventually they get to a point. Chris gets to a point because he's the leader. He tells the crew the water is literally rising, bro. Like we're not going to be able to go. And they end up. Your son vanished, get over it. This is what people have been saying to the poor mother of Jack O'Sullivan from Bristol. She's now fighting for answers after Jack went missing in April this year. Now, Jack was a 23-year-old student, a keen runner, and he'd actually just completed the Bath Half Marathon in 2023. On the 2nd of March 2024, Jack tried to get a taxi home after a night out. He texted his parents and he said that that's what he planned to do. Now, this was at around 1am that he texted his parents about this plan. It was seemingly unsuccessful, or his plans changed for whatever reason, we just simply don't know. We really don't know what happened in the next couple of hours, but what we do know is that 3.24am, Jack tried to call his friend, who was still at the party. Then, around five minutes later, the friend tried to call Jack back. However, the call mysteriously cut off after Jack said hello. Now, annoyingly, this image at the bottom kind of cuts it off, but he was last seen on CCTV at around 3.40 a.m. We know he walked up the Bennett Way slip road towards Hot Wells, but has never been seen since. Jack's phone was still active at an address in Granby Hill at 5.40 a.m., and his phone was still connected to the network until 6.44 a.m. No one has heard from Jack since. Frustratingly, Jack's case seems to have hit a dead end and his family are no closer to any answers about his whereabouts. We do, however, know that there were numerous vehicles on the road at the time of his disappearance, and also there may be people with ring doorbells who have footage of Jack and just don't know about it. This could give us vital clues as to where Jack ended up. If you know anything or if you have any information that you feel might be valuable, any CCTV footage, any ring doorbell footage, please do contact police or contact Jack's family via the website findjackosullivan.co.uk. They're currently offering a £20,000 reward. This streamer killed his girlfriend while live streaming and it's one of the most disturbing things ever streamed. Stanislav Reshnikov, who is on the left, is a vlogger slash streamer was famously known as Stas Reflay, and he inflicted inhumane physical abuse on his pregnant girlfriend, Valentina Grigoriva, who was on the right when a viewer asked him to do so for merely $1,000 in his YouTube live video. Valentina's beating was followed by Stas stripping her naked and forcefully locking her outside of the house in sub-zero temperatures of December. Valentina kept on knocking on the door telling him that she was going to die. After 15 minutes, Stas checked on Valentina as she stopped knocking on the door. He then found Valentina's unconscious, not breathing, and pale body. Stas made a failed attempt at resurrecting his girlfriend by giving her CPR. Eventually, he grew very scared of what he had done and called the paramedic team. In the footage, he can be seen carrying her back into his apartment trying to revive her. He is heard saying, Velia, are you alive? My bunny, what's up with you? Velia, Velia, damn, you look like you are dead. Bunny, come on, tell me something. I'm worrying. Damn, I'm not feeling a heartbeat, guys. No pulse. She's pale. She is not breathing. Wake up, Velia. I love you. Wake up. The paramedic team then arrived and announced Valentina dead upon examination. Initially, she was assumed to die from hypothermia. However, the forensic team revealed that Valentina had died from a head injury inflicted upon her during domestic violence. The police arrested Stas soon after he killed his pregnant girlfriend for money. And he was given a sentence of six years by the court in 2021. But what do you think about this? This man literally put his pregnant girlfriend outside in freezing cold temperatures for $1,000 because one of his viewers donated it and told him to. This is absolutely gut turning and the live stream if you ever decide to watch it is extremely unnerving, especially when her lifeless body gets brought into the live stream. Just hearing him talk to her and knowing that she's dead is extremely unsettling.
This is a story that everyone should know. This is Lizbeth Medina. She was a 16-year-old high school cheerleader who was found stabbed to death in her bathtub on December 5th. This is everything we know so far. On December 5th, Lizbeth's mom became worried about her after she didn't show up for an annual lighted Christmas parade in Edna, Texas. Lizbeth was supposed to be marching in the parade with her cheer squad, and when her mom couldn't find her, she rushed back to their home around 7 p.m. at the Cottonwood Apartments, and it was there that she discovered a gruesome scene. Lizbeth had been stabbed to death, and she was left in her bathtub. It was clear that she had been getting ready for the parade, and she was still in her pajamas. Edna police started looking for any leads because Lisbeth was just 16 years old. She didn't have any enemies, and this completely shocked the small community. Authorities soon discovered grainy surveillance footage of a possible suspect in the area, and they also disclosed a vehicle of interest, which was a silver Ford Taurus. Finally, on Saturday, police were given a tip which sent them to the small town of Schulenburg, Texas, and it was there that they arrested 23-year-old Rafael Romero at his family home. Authorities have confirmed that Rafael does own a silver Ford Taurus, which they've seized evidence from linking him to Lisbeth. According to Edna Police, Rafael has been living in Texas illegally on an expired visa, while his family has been living in Schulenburg for about five years. At this point, police have not discovered a motive for the killing, and they're trying to figure out if the two even knew each other. But they are saying that it is an isolated incident. Lisbeth's family has stated that they don't recognize Rafael or his family at all, but they do wonder if this was possibly related to a recent break-in attempt. Lisbeth's mom said that a few weeks before her murder, someone tried breaking into their home, and it's now left them wondering if this was the same intruder who may have tried breaking in again, but was taken by surprise that Lisbeth was home. Raphael has since been booked into the Jackson County Jail and charged with capital murder. This story is just absolutely heartbreaking. Lisbeth's mom had her when she was just 16 years old herself. She said that they grew up together, and it was just them against the world. The two had just moved to Edna last year, which makes the story even more heartbreaking. Lisbeth was described as bubbly, happy and confident, and she dreamed of becoming a nurse. Her face lit up whenever she cheered for her high school, and she'll be very missed. This should have never happened. I've attached a GoFundMe set up for the Medina family to help get them through this horrific time. And if you'd like to show your support and keep up to date with the information on the case, go follow the Facebook group Justice for Lisbeth Medina. We need to talk about the strange disappearance of Angie Pena. I recently made a video about Nancy Ng, a woman who went missing during a yoga retreat to Guatemala in October. But from that video, I got so many comments and messages from people saying how similar Nancy's case is to Angie's, so I decided to look into it. This is Angie Pena. She went missing on January 1st, 2022. She was last seen jet skiing away from a beach off the coast of Roatan in Honduras, but she never came back. Witnesses state that she was last seen in the West Bay area on her jet ski, but but when she failed to come back, she was reported missing. At first, authorities believed that she drifted off into the water and ultimately drowned, but her body never surfaced. A search was conducted by the Belize Coast Guard, and a few days later, Angie's jet ski, her life jacket, and one of her earrings were found what appeared to be washed up on a beach in Belize. But Angie herself was never found, and then came a shocking discovery a few months later in August, and this is where things start to get strange. While many people believed at first that this was an accidental drowning, behind the scenes, police were investigating investigating Angie's disappearance as something much more sinister. On August 29th, 2022, Honduran authorities raided five properties, one of which was an apartment owned by Gary Lee Johnston, a 63-year-old American living on the Caribbean resort island of Roatan. Information that authorities collected led them to search Gary's home, but they didn't find Angie. Instead, they found a young girl. Some reports say she was 12 and others say she was 17, being held in the home. Upon searching the home, authorities found more than 30 cell phones containing pictures and videos of Gary engaging in sexual activity with multiple minors. Along with that, authorities also found one of Angie's earrings and the swimsuit she was wearing the day she went missing in his home. Also found at the scene were videos directly linking Gary to Angie. According to a authorities, they found overwhelming witness, documental, and technological evidence connecting Gary to Angie's disappearance. But they also said that he did not act alone and that he's believed to be part of an international network or a human trafficking gang that's currently being investigated. At the time of Angie's disappearance, Gary was believed to have been living in Roatan for six years. He owned a condo building and was reportedly not widely known in the community. He was also one of the founders of an Arizona tech consulting company called IT Partners, which was established in 2004. After his arrest, the CEO of the company released this statement. Pause to read if you need to. 
Honduran authorities collected a lot of evidence from potential crime scenes, and they've gone on to say that from what they've collected, they can raise the possibility of recovering Angie alive. As of the most recent article, authorities strongly believe that Angie could still be alive and is possibly a victim of human trafficking. Most of the articles about Angie's disappearance are in Spanish, so I've had to rely on Google Translate. But from what I've gathered, Gary is still detained and has since been charged with possession of CP and his possible involvement in human trafficking. It will soon be two years since Angie disappeared disappeared, and with the evidence found, we need to find her fast. If you have any information at all, please contact the number on the screen. Nancy is also still missing, and both women deserve justice and for people to come forward and do the right thing. Hamira coined the phrase, you can't make this stuff up, but have known the story of real-life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic child, murderer, and cannibal. This is Police Chief Martin Brodie. He ran the Amity Island Police Department in the 1970s. One summer, during a beach party, Christy Watkins was attacked and killed in the sea with her remains being found the next day. Brodie wanted the beach shut down, but Mayor Larry Vaughan advised against this due to the impending arrival of summer tourists. He said it would ruin their economy if they closed the beach. Believing a shark attacked Christy, a bounty is placed on its head and a huge tiger shark is soon caught. The beach was then reopened. Later, after no human remains were found inside the tiger shark, a packed July 4th beach suffered an attack from a great white shark. Quint, Brody, and Hooper set sail on the orca in an attempt to capture and kill it. A back and forth battle then took place with Quint being eaten by the shark. The shark was finally destroyed when a scuba tank was placed in its mouth and shot by Brody, causing it to explode. Because after all, this is the creeper. He's an ancient demonic monster who becomes active every 23rd spring for 23 days and feasts on the body parts of humans. Trish and Darry Jenner once spotted the creeper sliding what looked like dead bodies down a pipe which was sticking out of the ground. When they searched the pipe they found hundreds of bodies sewn together, including those of Kenny and Darla who went missing 23 years earlier. They fled to a gas station where they received a call from a psychic. She played them the song Jeepers Creepers and said if they ever hear it, they're in danger. When the police arrived they told the couple the church next to the pipe had been set alight. The underground lair, known as the House of Pain, was therefore destroyed. The police then heard the song Jeepers Creepers and were soon killed by the creeper. It was run over by the couple but remained alive. It then feasted on some prisoners to heal itself. A cat and mouse chase ended with the creeper escaping out of a window. He then removed Darry's eyes and replaced his own with them. Which echoes the song lyrics, Where'd you get those peepers? He was soon back on the road hunting for more victims. Nearly 200 decaying bodies have been found at a Colorado funeral home. Police in Colorado made a very grim discovery earlier this month. The remains of at least 189 people were found at a funeral home in Pensor. It's reported that this came after it was reported there was an abhorrent smell coming from inside of the building. Police showed up on the 4th of October and were stunned by what they found. It's believed that the number of bodies is expected to increase pending further investigation. Families of the deceased found at the Return to Nature funeral home are devastated by the discovery. There's now the huge job underway of identifying all of the deceased people. This will include using dental records and DNA testing. The owner of the funeral home admitted that there has been a problem there. A potential criminal investigation is underway. Imagine getting a speeding fine for $1.4 million. That happened to one man in Georgia. On the 2nd of September 2023, Connor Cato was doing 90 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone. He was pulled over by police and was absolutely stunned by the speeding fine that he received. Now they issued him the speeding fine via e-ticket and when he got home and accessed the ticket he saw that it stated 1.4 million dollars. He incorrectly assumed that it was a typo and rang them up. On the phone the member of staff told him that it was actually correct and he was to either pay the amount or show up in court. Now it transpires that the city of Savannah does this intentionally to get people to attend court. They stated, the balance reflected is a placeholder, not a fine. The fine for a super speeder ticket can only be set by a judge. Since super speeders are required to go to court, the software automatically puts in a base amount plus state mandated costs. 
Even the criminal defense attorney stated that he had never seen something like that before in his life. Rage quitted at a Madden esports tournament and shot two people to death. My name is David Katz and this is my story. At the age of 24, I was a full-time professional Madden player from Baltimore, Massachusetts. I was really good and in August 2018, I made the trip to Jacksonville for a tournament. I started my professional career in 2017 and in the three years as a pro, I've amassed the immense fortune of $10,000. The tournament in Jacksonville started in the morning and this time things didn't go well for me. I played a few games and lost them all. I couldn't believe it. I wasn't used to such a mediocre performance. I was eliminated from the tournament and had no chance of winning. In my rage, I refused to shake hands with the other competitors and left the tournament in a state of extreme madness. I grabbed one of my handguns that I had taken with me to Jacksonville and walked back to the venue. I was sick of losing, and the other players mocking me made me even more angry. I decided to enter the building and opened fire on everyone in there. When it was all said and done, I had killed two people and injured ten others. I then put the gun to my head and took my own life. This horrible event has rekindled the debate about the dangers of video games. Have you ever heard of this story? Tell me in the comments and subscribe for even more stories. This woman faked her own kidnapping and thought that she could get away with it. On July 13th, the 25-year-old Carly Russell called police to report a child wandering on the side of the road. When police arrived to the scene, they found her car along with her wig and her phone, but Carly and the child were not there. Police now thought, okay, not only do we have a missing child, but now we have a missing 25-year-old woman. 49 hours after Carly went missing and after the story was all over the news, she randomly showed up to her family's house and everyone including the police were confused and this is what she had to say she said that after she spoke to police on the phone she was forced into a car by a man with orange hair she then says that she was able to escape but then she was recaptured and forced to get naked and take photos but then carly was able to get away again and this time she ran through the woods and made it home police noticed that carly's story was just not making sense investigators noted that carly drove over 600 yards while on the phone with 911 when she specifically said that she was following the little kid. Carly's internet searches were also weird. She was searching the movie Taken, which if you know, it's about a woman being abducted. Eventually, Carly's lawyer made a statement that she made this whole thing up. She was charged and ordered to pay $18,000 in restitution and spend one year in prison. I guess she did this all for attention, but I mean, she did get it. Wiped millions from banks just to help out poor kids in Palestine. And now they're trying to hit me with the death sentence. My name is Hamza Bendelaj, and I'm here to share you how I became a modern-day Robin Hood. At 27, I was a tech enthusiast from Algeria with a deep passion for hacking. I've always felt a profound empathy for the less fortunate, especially the Palestinian people who have been through so much. In 2017, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I hacked into 217 American banks, stealing over $4 billion. But this money wasn't for me, I immediately donated every single penny to charities in Palestine, aiming to provide some relief to those in need. However, my actions caught the attention of the authorities, and it wasn't long before I was apprehended. The judges showed no mercy, sentencing me to death for my crimes. But as I walked to my execution, I had no regrets. I smiled, knowing that my actions had potentially saved thousands of lives. I believed I had served a greater good, even if it cost me my life. My story quickly spread across social media, turning me into a sensation and sparking a global debate about justice, morality, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Millions praised my actions, while others debated the ethics of my methods. Don't hesitate to hit like and comment your thoughts on this complex situation. And remember to subscribe for more thought-provoking stories. This former YouTuber was arrested after committing the most unspeakable crimes against his own child and he was later found hanging in his prison cell. I wanna give you a trigger warning before I talk about this because this case is disturbing. This is Carl Harold. He was born in the early 1980s and he was a computer whiz. So Carl uploaded his first YouTube video in July of 2012. In these videos, he was instructing people on how to program computers and shockingly, his channel is still up on YouTube to this day. As you can see here, he had around 30,000 subscribers before he was arrested. And due to fascination about this guy after the crime, I think that's why some of his videos have substantial amounts of views. 
So Carl seemed like a very harmless guy. He had a nine-year-old son. He was living his best life. That is, until December of 2013, when Carl was arrested with another man named Charles Dunavant. Carl and Charles were domestic and romantic partners, and they were arrested for disturbing crimes. So these two sickos who lived with each other in Alabama actually held Carl's son hostage for eight months straight. Keep in mind, Carl had a nine-year-old son. And what these two men did to the boy was unspeakable. They were charged with crimes like sexual torture, exposing a minor to an STD, sodomy, and yes, in a dark twist, the production of CP. So Carl and Charles were part of a larger CP network that existed on the dark web. And like I said, for eight months, they had been holding Carl's son hostage, abusing him in horrific ways, taking photos and videos of all of this and uploading it to this ring on the internet. In a news article that I read about this case, the Alabama police officers actually couldn't report on what they had found in the house, like the photos and videos, because they claimed it was so horrific they couldn't bear to look at the content. So that just goes to show how truly twisted these two people were. Now, they were going to be co-defendants and tried together, but about exactly a year to the day after Carl Harold was arrested, he was found hanged in his jail cell. He had taken his own life before he had to face the repercussions for these terrible acts. Eventually, though, Charles Dunavant was sentenced to 36 years in prison. And while I don't think that that's nearly long enough, at least he didn't take the easy way out like Carl. And I hope that his life in prison is absolutely as horrific as it could possibly be. It is eerie, though, thinking that YouTube has kept Carl's channel online. And I think it's definitely one of the channels that YouTube should look at terminating. This news reporter took her own life on live TV. This is Christine Chubbuck. She was born in Hudson, Ohio in 1944, and in her adult life she earned a broadcasting degree and started working for various news TV stations. Throughout her life, Christine worked in Cleveland, in Pittsburgh, in Canton, Ohio, but eventually she ended up in Sarasota, Florida. Now, Christine spoke with her family members at length throughout her life about her struggles with depression and her ideation of the thought of taking her own life. She had been seeing a psychiatrist for several weeks leading up to her own death, and it's a widespread belief that it was Christine's lack of focus on intimate personal relationships that led her to take her own life. So it's been reported that Christine had a crush on her coworker George. At one point she baked him a cake for his birthday and she sought out some sort of a romantic connection with George, but she was crushed to find out that he was already intimately involved with another reporter. Throughout her time at the station in Sarasota, Florida, Christine exhibited some concerning behavior. She was rude and standoffish to people who made friendly gestures toward her. She didn't really seem like she wanted to make friends. And a week before she took her own life, she told the night news editor, a man named Rob, that she had recently bought a gun and joked about taking her own life on air. Now, Rob brushed this off and said he didn't want to respond to this sick humor, but he had no idea that Christine was actually being serious. So a few days before she took her own life, Christine hosted a party. And a lot of her co-workers, fellow reporters, attended this party and they saw that Christine was completely different. She seemed to be so happy. She was having fun. She was carefree. One sportscaster that was at the party even stated later on that this was a completely different side of Christine and that they didn't realize this was her going away party, her way to say goodbye. Then came the morning of July 15th, 1974. On that morning, Christine confused her co-workers by stating she had to read a newscast before the program she hosted, which she never did. So she spent eight minutes reading off local news stories, headlines, and even covered a story about a shooting that had happened in Sarasota. But when it came time to play the newsreel about the shooting that had already been filmed, Christine broke the script. So I'm going to read this quote to you. She looked at the camera and said, In keeping with the WXLT practice of presenting the most immediate and complete records of local blood and guts news, TV40 presents what is believed to be a television first, in living color, an exclusive coverage of an attempted unaliving. Christine then pulled out a revolver and shot herself behind her right ear. She fell forward violently and the director of the television program then faded the screen to black. The station then ran a standard public service announcement and began playing a movie. Eerily, when the news director then found the papers that Christine had been reading from, he discovered that the entire thing had been scripted and written out by Christine. This included the stories she was going to cover, the act of actually taking her own life, and it even included a third-person perspective of what the next person taking over on the broadcast should read to the audience. Christine was then taken to a local hospital where she was pronounced dead 14 hours later. 
So for years, the television station that aired this footage claimed that the actual footage, the tape of Christine doing this, was lost forever. And people considered this to be a piece of lost media, meaning a piece of footage that existed at one point but doesn't exist anymore. But back in 2016, the station said that they had actually located the video. But obviously, they're never going to release it, and I don't think they should. Either way, Christine was remembered with fondness by everybody around her. She had a big funeral. Lots of people, public officials came forward and attended the funeral and said that she was just an amazing person. And obviously, this is such a tragic story. And it was, indeed, the very first time that somebody had taken their own life on live TV. In 2001, a woman named Fatima Rayman began writing to Charles, and after visiting him a number of times, she married him. Charles briefly converted to his wife's faith of Islam and wished to be called Charles Ali Ahmed. His marriage to Fatima lasted for four years, and during this time, Charles appealed his life sentence. On this occasion, references from psychologists were quite positive, and Charles told the court how Fatima and her daughter were helping to rehabilitate him. Despite this, his appeal was rejected. Charles remained a Category A prisoner at Wakefield Prison, and in 2008 he was due a parole hearing. Charles's lawyer was given a one-hour parole interview, which he refused, saying that he needed a full day to deal with Charles's case. The hearing was delayed and actually took place in March 2009, and Charles was denied parole. In 2013, a petition signed by 10,000 people was presented to 10 Downing Street, calling for Charles's release. It included a note from Charles himself to David Cameron, asking for his release and saying that he wished to live the rest of his life on the outside instead of being buried in the prison system. Nothing became of the petition and Charles continued with prison life. In 2014, Charles discovered that some of his mail was being withheld, including two letters from his mother. He attacked the prison governor, resulting in serious bruising, and two years were added to his sentence. After this incident, he changed his name by deed poll to Charles Salvador, saying Charles Bronson came alive in 1987 and he died in 2014. Under his new name, he began creating brilliant works of art described as fantasy reality, and some of these were auctioned in October 2014. He used the money to buy his mother a holiday. In 2017, actress Paula Williamson began writing to Charles. They quickly started a relationship and Charles proposed on Valentine's Day. The couple married at Wakefield Prison on November 14th. Paula led a bizarre procession through Wakefield before being bundled into the prison under a purple cloak. The couple walked down the aisle to the death march and then Charles was led back to his cell while Paula went to her wedding reception. The reception was held at the York House Hotel in Wakefield and some of the guests included Katie Price's former flame Alex Reed and ex-boxer Andrew Parkin and a Bronson look-alike with which Paula had her first dance. The marriage didn't last too long and was annulled after Charles saw pictures in the media of Paula on holiday with other men. There was also a disagreement over Charles wanting Paula to wear a cat suit to visit him in prison. In 2018, Charles was accused of attacking the governor at Wakefield Prison over his guests not being allowed to take pictures at his wedding. He was also angry at the fact that he hadn't been allowed to wear a suit to his own wedding, instead having to walk down the aisle in a stripy green and yellow jumpsuit. He's said to have lunged at the governor, knocking him to the floor, and threatened to gouge his eyes out and bite his nose off. Charles denied this, saying that all he intended to do was give the governor a gentle bear hug and ask where his wedding pictures were, when someone tripped him and he fell into the governor, knocking him to the floor. He said, For the first time in my 44 years in prison, I never intended to be violent. I didn't intend to hurt the governor. Charles was found not guilty and was moved to Woodhill Prison. Over the years, Charles has raised thousands of pounds selling his belongings and artwork, all of which has gone to charity. In 2016, he auctioned one of his pieces of art to raise money for treatment with a child with cerebral palsy. He's also put his artwork up for sale at exhibitions, saying that he hopes it'll increase his chances at parole by demonstrating that he could have an occupation if he's released. Charles is also a successful author, writing 16 books, one, a book of poetry with his friend Richard Booth pictured above, a book detailing his friendship with the Cray Twins, 
and also a book of his artwork, among others. In 2020, Charles won a High Court battle for his parole board hearing to be held in public, citing his right to a fair trial. And on Monday, March 6, 2023, his parole board hearing began. He told the panel at HMP Woodhill, I'm terrified of the consequences of my actions. I know if I do something serious ever again, I'll die in prison. I'm anti-crime, I am anti-violence. All I want to do is go out and do my art. He was wearing a dark suit, dark tie and white shirt with green braces and his signature round glasses. He now needs to wear dark lenses in his glasses as 40 years in solitary confinement has made his eyes sensitive to light. When asked about his confrontations with prison guards over the years, he said it was always in response to being treated badly. He said, a rumble clears the air. What man doesn't love a rumble? I know I do, but I'm too old to fight now. If someone wanted to make a name by attacking me now, I'd say, come on mate, there's a cafe over there. Let's go and have a cup of tea. His prison offender manager said that he's made really good progress and has been rehabilitated over the last 12 years. But she fears that he might not cope if he's moved from his close supervision centre of eight people into an open community. Charles's parole hearing is ongoing and a decision on his release is imminent. This is the story of the infamous Charles Bronson, not to be confused with cult leader and mass murderer Charles Manson. Believe it or not, Bronson's never actually killed anyone. So how does a young boy, once described by his aunt as a kind, gentle, loving boy, turn into one of Britain's most notorious prisoners? I'll take you right back to the beginning. He was born Michael Peterson on December 6th, 1952, in Luton, Bedfordshire, to parents Ira and Joe. Michael's aunt described him as a loving, gentle, kind, mild-mannered boy who would always stand up for the weak and defend them against their bullies. When he was a teenager, his parents moved him and his two brothers to Cheshire. This is when he started getting into trouble. He was caught stealing at 13 and reprimanded in juvenile court. He returned to Luton, which he describes as his hometown, and continued to get into trouble. One night he got into an argument with one of his girlfriend's fathers and smashed up a load of parked cars. This landed him with a fine and probation. He then decided to steal a lorry and smashed it into a parked car that had somebody sat inside. For this, he received another fine and again probation. And then he decided to take part in a smash and grab raid. This landed him with a suspended sentence. This is all before he even turned 20. In 1971, Michael met Irene Kelsey. She said that he was different to other boys. He was very well groomed, wore tailored suits, had perfectly groomed sideburns and a Cockney accent. Irene soon fell pregnant and they got married at Chester Register Office. In 1974, and after a few years out of trouble and despite the fact he was now a father, Michael stepped up his criminal career and took part in an armed robbery. This landed him with a seven-year sentence. He was first sent to Walton Prison, but after attacking two prisoners, he was transferred to Hull. In Hull Prison, he had an altercation with a prison officer in which he smashed up a workshop and had to be injected with a sedative. This got him another six months added to his sentence. Michael was constantly in trouble and in and out of solitary confinement. At one point, he attacked fellow prisoner John Henry Gallagher with a glass jug. This got him another nine months added to his sentence. For the next two years, Michael was constantly moved between Pankhurst, Wakefield, Armley and Walton due to his violent behaviour. And he was eventually transferred from Yorkshire to London, chained to the floor of a prison van. In 1976, he was briefly moved back to Pankhurst, where he befriended Ronnie and Reggie Cray. He describes them as the best two guys he's ever met. Michael was then handed divorce papers from his wife Irene, and this only fueled his anger. He attacked another prisoner, threatened to kill a prison guard, and was caught trying to dig his way out of his cell. In 1978, Michael attempted suicide, and it was decided that he'd be transferred under the Mental Health Act to Rampton Secure Hospital. Michael really struggled to adapt to forced medication, and he hated being surrounded by mentally ill patients. He said he saw people running into walls using their heads as battering rams and stabbing themselves with pens, needles and scissors. While at Rampton, Michael attempted to kill child rapist and murderer John White. He described John as a slimy rat that had evil all over his face. His plan was simple. If he killed the monster, 
He'd be sent to court and sent back to a normal prison. He also said that he'd be doing the world a favour by ridding it of John White. He waited until they were in the day room together, crept up behind John, whipped off his tie and wrapped it round his neck. All of the other patients were watching. Some were laughing, some just staring. Just as John stopped breathing, two guards managed to run over and prise Michael's hands off him, saving his life. Michael said he heard shouts for oxygen as he was dragged back to his cell, laughing hysterically. He said he'd gone completely mad. He was injected with a sedative that made him violently ill. He was extremely disappointed when he learned that John White had survived the attack. Michael was soon transferred to Broadmoor, where he was reunited with Ronnie Cray. After a failed attempt at strangling fellow prisoner George Robinson, Michael's mood was extremely low. Ronnie arranged a visit from former world boxing champion Tony Downs, and this really lifted Michael's spirits. Michael decided to get back to full fitness, and he soon came up with a plan to climb up to the roof and let out some anger. He made it through a cell window, climbed up a drainpipe, and made it to the roof of Broadmoor. He began throwing tiles off the top of the roof, saying that each one represented a year he'd spent locked up. Michael said he felt like he was emptying himself of years of pain. He spent the night looking up at the stars for the first time in eight years, and then climbed down in the morning and went back inside. When Michael was refused a transfer, he decided to go on an 18-day hunger strike. He was eventually transferred to Ashworth Hospital. For the next year, he was moved between Risley, Albany, Wormwood Scrubs, Winchester, Wandsworth, and finally, Gartree. In 1987, Michael was finally released after spending 13 years behind bars. He spent a few days living with his parents before buying a water pistol, modifying it to look like a gun, and intimidating a stranger to drive him to Luton. Michael's longtime friend Reggie Cray then persuaded him to take up an illegal career in bare knuckle boxing in London's East End, and on the advice of his fight promoter, he changed his name to Charles Bronson. By 1988, Charles had a girlfriend, and much to her surprise on New Year's Day, he robbed a jewellery store, gave her a ring from his stash, and sold the rest. Just a week later, and after only two months of freedom, Charles was arrested on his morning jog, and returned to prison. His girlfriend actually acted as the key witness, and he was found guilty and sentenced to seven years. Once again, Charles found himself being moved between various prisons for his violent behaviour. At Full Sutton, he punched a prisoner, a prison officer, and threw water over the governor. He spent a month at Durham, where he befriended a family of rodents that crept into his cell, and he was then moved to Long Latin. He seemed to settle well at this prison until one day something sent him over the edge, and he ran riot in the nude, clutching a spear that he'd made out of a broken bottle and a broom handle. Over the next three years, he was moved between Wandsworth, Gartry, where he punched two prison officers, and Franklin, where he took the deputy governor hostage. In 1992, while imprisoned at Pankhurst, he was on the receiving end of an attack where he was stabbed in the back several times by two other inmates. He refused to talk to police about the attack and recovered without any further incidents. He was then released from prison in November 1992. Charles was a free man for a total of 53 days before again being arrested, this time for conspiracy to rob and possession of a sawn-off shotgun. While on remand, he took a librarian hostage and demanded an inflatable doll, a helicopter, and a cup of tea. He eventually released his prisoner after being disgusted that he'd broken wind in front of him. On September 14th, 1993, Charles was found guilty of intent to rob and given an eight-year sentence. He was taken to Wakefield Prison, where he spent a total of 40 days naked in isolation before being transferred to Hull. While at Hull, he took the deputy governor hostage and after being overpowered by guards, he was transferred back to Wakefield Prison, where he was imprisoned in what's known as the Hannibal Cage, once occupied by killer Robert Maudsley. It was inside this cage, and thanks to one prison guard, Mick O'Hagan, that he discovered his talent for drawing. Charles described the cell as dark and gloomy. There were four sets of bars on the windows stopping the air coming through, there was a cage on the door, all the furniture was cardboard, and if you got a library book, you'd be lucky. Mick O'Hagan approached Charles and said, You've been in solitary for 21 years. Don't you want to get out? Charles replied, of course I do. To which Mick told him, you're going the wrong way about it. All this hostage taking, violence and assaults. Why don't you start using your loaf? Start boxing clever. Why don't you take up something like writing or art? The next day, Mick took some colouring pencils and a sketch pad down to Charles and told him to start drawing. The next day, when Mick visited Charles, he handed him a drawing and from then on, every day, all day, he'd just sit in that cage, doodling and sketching, and he found a real talent for art. 
Despite settling well at Wakefield Prison, he was again moved, this time to Lincoln, where he was allowed to spend time with children with Down syndrome. Despite getting on really well with the children, he was returned to solitary confinement after coming back from his exercise 30 minutes late. He was then moved to Belmarsh where he took two Iraqi hijackers hostage. He forced them to tickle his feet and call him General and he then demanded a plane to take him to Libya, two machine guns and an axe. At one point he started chanting I want ice cream before hitting one of his hostages over the head with a metal tray. He felt really guilty about this and insisted that his hostage then hit him and call it quits. He eventually released his two hostages and another five years were added to his sentence. In January 1999, Charles took another hostage. This time it was prison art teacher Phil Danielson. Phil had criticised one of Charles's drawings and he'd seen red. He tore up the prison, throwing furniture and fridges around and even shocked himself and knocked himself out while wrenching a washing machine out of the wall. The siege lasted for 44 hours before he eventually let Phil go. He received a discretionary life sentence to run a minimum of three years. A special prison unit was then set up at Woodhill for Charles, murderer Robert Maudsley and murderer Reginald Wilson. Despite having never committed a murder, Charles was now locked up with two of Britain's most prolific murderers. Please follow for part two.